Greetings my friends, how are you doing? This is Zev from Zed Outdoors and I hope you're having an awesome day. So today I am joined by a friend of mine, Will Priestley. Will, how are you doing? Good thanks Zed, good to have you here mate. Thank you so much. Well, where I am is a different story. I'm actually in Bristol, which is in the west of England, the historic city of Bristol. So I'm down here for the day to see friends Will and Jack, who you'll also be seeing in a future video. Now, Will and myself have been, we've been acquainted for a few years now, haven't we? I think we met uh, a few years ago, Spoonfest. Spoonfest? my first Spoonfest, so. That's right, yeah. Four or five. Yeah, that was about four years ago. Something four like years that. ago, yeah. yeah. So that's it, man, me and him go way back. So Will, in case you're not familiar with Will, Will is a very respected spoon carver, and now a full-time spoon carver, I believe. About the, right. the, the past year, the past year, so he's transitioned onto being a full-time spoon carver. What was it you did before? Uh, ecology, yeah, I believe. Yeah, well, eco ecological surveys. All and, over the place. And was that around the United Kingdom? Yeah, mostly the South, but anywhere they sent me, I sort of <laughs> I didn't, didn't really get a choice. <laughs> <laughs> so you've transitioned on to now being a full-time spoon carver, yeah. um, and I've let alone uh, Will being a friend, is also uh, producing a lot of beautiful work that I'm really kind of astonished every time I see it on Instagram, on, on Facebook. So today what Will has very kindly allowed me to do is visit his humble workshop here in his cave. home, in his little man cave here in Bristol, uh, to uh, record uh, one or two videos. And with his kind of permission, what Will has very graciously allowed me to do is to document his entire process from start to finish on how he himself carves a wooden spoon. Now, this is not the best way. He's not saying this is the only way. This is Will's way, uh, and it's a very effective way of how he carves his spoons. And what he hopes to do throughout this entire video is tackle a lot of the potential issues, especially new spoon carvers come across. And would you say that's pretty accurate to say? Yeah, lots of things like the areas of the spoon where the grain changes direction, just getting smooth finishes, and all the things that I struggled with. Hopefully, I'll try and show ways to get around or make it a bit easier. Perfect, now I look forward to hearing that. One thing I will say off the bat, we are in Bristol. Bristol is a city. So if you hear background noise, Will actually lives on a main road here in the center of Bristol. So hopefully that is not too much of a distraction, but hey, you know, this is his workspace. So obviously we're being as natural as we can to the way Will normally works. So Neil, Neil, uh, Will also teaches one-to-one. Uh, uh, -one. He sells his woodenware, so he's very experienced when it comes to spoon carving and green woodworking in general. So in this video, I really hope you gain a lot of value from Will's teaching. It's actually going to be the first time I see Will's process from start to finish, so I'm going to be learning just as much as you are. So what we're going to do first is before we kick off the tutorial, we're actually going to look at a few examples of Will's work so you can get up an idea of the kind of work that he produces and then we'll get straight into this video. So without further ado, we hope you enjoy the rest of this tutorial where Will Priestley is going to be teaching you how to carve a wooden spoon. So Will, this is obviously a very small selection of the spoons that you carved. Do you want to just talk us through a little bit of sure. what you got here? Yeah. Um, these ones are actually all carved out of cherry, which is the wood I've definitely carved most of. I think it's probably my favorite um, to carve. You get this amazing grain. Um, it's not too hard, not too soft. It's perfect for me. Um, I like to carve different styles. Obviously spoons come in all shapes and sizes. Um, these two big serving spoons are something that are quite popular, but I don't make all that many of just because of the effort that goes into making them. So they're kind of, it kind of makes them extra special as well, that there aren't so many of them. Um, then you've got something, this is a, this sort of spoon, something like I'm going to carve today, uh, just a, a standard eating spoon, um, again in cherry. This is a, a soup spoon based on the Welsh cow style, but actually I, I think I made after seeing your video with Owen, sort of inspired me to do that, so that was quite nice. And, and, and would you say also because you're literally on the border with Wales, um, yeah. being in Bristol? Um, if I'm totally honest, that didn't have too much to do with it, <laughs> but that's a nice, uh, yeah, that's a, that is a nice to think about as well. Um, when you talk about Welsh spoons, most people think about love spoons with these sort of really intricate handles, but not a lot of sort of practical use. So it's nice to have a spoon that people are going to use and not put on the wall. Um, 
there's styles like this that I don't carve so often, which sort of is more of a Swedish style. You've got the big bowl and almost an equal sized handle. Um, you see people like Jared Dahl carve a lot of things like that. They're quite nice. And this is actually stained with some natural dye that they got in Morocco. Um, these ones are dem uh, decorated with milk paint, which is something that I've been using quite a lot recently. Still getting to grips with it, but I really like how it just gives a new, another like dimension to the spoon. Um, obviously, they come in all all sorts of colours. Um, I really like how they how they sort of work with the cherry wood. The sort of rich golden cherry wood goes really nicely with the paints. So, do you tend to carve more functional and usable spoons? Yeah, I don't make anything to hang on a wall or sit on a shelf and gather dust. Everything I make. I want people to use them, love them, look after them so that they last a long time, but absolutely it's all to be, all to be used. Cool, so I've split this bit of cherry and first thing I'm going to do is we've got this pith running down the middle that we want to get rid of. Um, so I'm just going to flatten off this bottom edge. I like to have sort of flat square edges while I'm working. It just makes things easier in my mind. So I'll get this nice and flat before we go on to anything else. And I'm just sort of uh, taking these sort of wide chunks off, not trying to take off too much at a time. And obviously I'm not axing too far up towards my hand because I'm using quite strong strokes my accuracy isn't so good. And may so, I ask, may I ask yeah. uh, what axe you're using? Yep this is the uh, Grand Swiss Brooks I think it's a Swedish it's called a Swedish carving axe or a large carving axe I was lucky enough to be given it by a friend who oh, wow. had it sat in a cupboard for a couple of years um, so I'm really grateful about that. I think they're quite, quite hard to get held of these days. Okay, so the pith is gone. Um, I probably came back about a ring distance, if you look. It was about sort of here. Um, and, and, and why is it important to remove the pith? Yeah, well, one reason is just that it's quite a fibrous part of the, part of the wood and it's quite weak and if you leave it in, it's just going to fall out over time. The other reason is, as the wood dries, a lot of the tension is around the pith, and although it's never happened to me, there is always a risk that that's where the wood's going to crack. So, I mean, part of that is just, if you try and dry it too quickly, it'll probably crack anyway, but we just take that out just to remove that risk. Uh, next thing I'll do, that's nice and flat, is just, um, take off some of the top edge, see what I'm working with, um, and give myself a, a little bit of a slope. I'm not going to put the crank in yet, but I just like to have the handle end slightly higher up, and I'll come down uh, to the bowl end. Just looking at the piece of wood, I've just noticed there's a knot here that could come straight through into the bowl, and I'd, I'd rather have that at the handle end. So I'll have the handle up here and the bowl down here. So with the knots, just for those watching, you don't want to be including that, is that correct? In the yeah, piece? you can. Um, there's nothing really wrong with having a knot. The, the wood is a bit harder to carve around that area and the grain is kind of funny. So knowing that my handle is going to be up here, sort of this wide, and the knot's here, I'm probably going to lose the knot anyway. It, I think it probably comes through, actually you can see, it comes through to there. So I'll, in carving the handle, I'll probably lose that, so I don't have to worry about it. So, I'm just starting down here. Oops. My chopping blocks need some new legs, it's a little bit wobbly. So I've got, I'm looking to get a kind of parallel edge here to the bottom. Again, like I said, I like sort of neat square edges. So that's the handle end, and then I'll just ease into it. When I'm axing up high like this, 
and make sure that I'm not swinging the axe too hard and being inaccurate. If you want you can put stop cuts coming up like this. I tend to prefer just getting into it and following this kind of curl all the way down. And now I'm looking at this thickness here at the bowl end. How wide do I want it? I want it thick enough that I'm going to be able to get some crank in there. But I don't want too much crank that might sort of weaken the spoon. And by crank, what do you mean by crank? Yeah, so the crank is basically the angle between the bowl and the, the handle. As in the sort of swoop. A cooking spoon has no crank. It's just flat. A ladle has lots of crank. So it's, yeah, it's just the angle between the handle and the bowl. So I'm sort of levering out as I come down, loosening the fibers, and then I can just follow it down like that. Probably come into a decent thickness, but I want to even it off and get it flat. So something like that looks right. If you see it from here, I've got a very slight curve, which actually isn't going to really have any relation to the finished spoon, but I like to have the handle a little bit higher. Okay, so now I'm going to start thinking about the outline of the spoon. And though I'm not going to actually draw exactly how I want it now. I sort of want an idea. I probably wouldn't normally draw this, but just to give an idea for the video. There's going to be a center line and where I want to put the crank of the spoon is towards the back of the bowl. So I don't want, I don't want the handle to come down and then the bowl to start and suddenly kick back up. I want it to be quite sort of gradual like this. So the low point is going to be somewhere uh, in the widest part of the bowl. And I usually think it's kind of standard um, proportions for a spoon is about a third of the length for the bowl and then two thirds for the handle and I tend to find about three fingers is pretty good for the for the bowl so about here so then the bowl is going to be something like that again I, I use sort of my my hands and my fingers over over time I've sort of found that a good width of a bowl is two thumbs, a good length of a bowl is three fingers. So it's quite good as you carve more, you can figure this stuff out and you don't have to keep measuring stuff and sort of putting things in your mouth and being like, oh, I should have gone a bit thinner there or whatever. So I tend to go roughly two thumbs, so I know it's gonna be about there and about there. And that's kind of my bowl size. The handle's gonna come back here, obviously. So the crank is going to be about there. Maybe push it back a little bit. All right. So I normally wouldn't draw that on, but it's good to just get a sort of visual uh, picture of it. So what I'm going to do to, to put the crank in is I'm going to have to axe down from one side and axe back from the other side. And I'm going to saw a stop cut in here because if I just you can axe down without a stop cut, but there's a danger that you're going to split through and knock the end off. So, this saw is probably a bit overkill. That's a man saw, that. <laughs> this is a, a WP Woodcraft folding buck saw. This is something you made? Yeah, I, I made these actually, yeah. So, just get the, get the cut going. There we go. Should have brought a silky. There we go. Oh, let me just put that axe down for a sec so I can knock it off. So I'm going to stop, have a look to see how deep I've gone. And I want to make sure that I've gone the same distance on both sides. Uh, I don't want to go too deep because it'll leave the bottom of the spoon thin. 
but if I go not deep enough then I'm going to have to take some of the back off and actually that is preferable you to take some off the back because if you go too deep there's not really much saving uh, much you can do to save that so that looks okay I might go just a little bit further and looking where I sort of mark the width because I'm going to axe down here and back here if I do it with the log this this size there's all of this wood here that I'm I'm not going to need that is just going to make things a bit more difficult so I'm just going to thin off the wood about there and I'll just bump that off so that was a drop cut that you did? Yeah, so I just, it's using the weight of the axe basically. It's safe because I'm not lifting the axe off the wood. Gently, until you can, you can feel and, and hear slightly that it's, it's started to split and there's a very small split there. So now that it's in, I can sort of you know, it's safe, and I can go a bit harder. And I'm not worried about where the split's going because I've given myself enough leeway. That I'm not worried that it's gonna split into the spoon. Okay, so that's a bit, gonna be a bit easier to now ax, ax down and ax back. Um, there's a couple of ways you can approach this. You can just go straight for the, the whole width which does mean you have to hit it a bit harder and the, the danger of hitting it harder is you've got less control and if you go through and split that off it's one of those mistakes that you can't really come back from. Another way you can do it is to take the corners off which is much less work. Again you see as I come in closer to the stop cut I'm being more careful and I'm just prizing, prizing the wood off and then you can come from this side. Just looking, so now I've got down to the cut there, I've almost down to the cut there and then I'll come back to the middle, coming right up here but I'm being really careful. My fingers are well out of the way. So you can see this movement that I'm doing is, is almost splitting the wood back. I just want to keep going until I'm down to the bottom of the cut, which is about there. So. I'll do a bit more uh, with the knife, so that's probably not the exact line I'm going to have. Um, maybe it's a bit bit more humped than I want it, or I'll, I'll straighten out or something, but that's good for now. So the next bit is I'm going to, I want to axe back here, back to the stop cut. This is a really tricky one, you don't want to come at it in the same way like this. The best way is to come across the grain and depending on what sort of axe you have can make a difference with this. So this has got sort of quite a long sweeping blade, curved blade. So I tend to come at it with, the, with this part of the blade. If you've got something like a, like a wildlife hatchet or something with a straighter blade, it might be easier to come in with the tip, more like that. But if you kind of start here and you can ease your way back to where you want to be about there and then as you've got this cut you can go a bit harder one thing that I like to do is I'm working on the edge of the block and the, the axe is actually hitting the block which means that I can't go too far through into the side that I don't want to hit so I'm actually hitting the, the axe, you can see I'm hitting the block here before I go all the way through. It's just a little sort of 
safety measure. So as I'm coming towards the other side, I am actually using the tip. And I'm slicing through. And I'm constantly sort of looking to straighten this, how even it is. I want to get this, keep this parallel with the bottom. When you get down a bit further, it can be a bit more tricky. I always find this side much easier because I can sort of see it from the top and then coming through, I find it harder to get as close to the line on this side. You can either, like I was doing there, sort of slice through like this. Another thing you can do is to come at it from this side with the other side of the ax. You can also get right down here and come with it like this. Although it can be a bit tricky, you sort of have to support it on your wrist. Again, I'm using the, the block as a, as a sort of stop. So I'll just take that last bit off. You can use the axe as almost like a sort of, what would you call that, like a plane, I guess. You don't have to be super tidy. That's one thing that I've sort of, you can get hung up on, oh, this has to be just right, I have to meet the lines, I have to get a nice smooth finish. And all of this is gonna get taken off later anyway. So don't worry too much about getting perfectly down to the line there. It doesn't matter, you can fix it. So Will, what's next? Uh, I'm gonna draw the shape of the spoon. Uh, you don't have to. I find it much easier to have a line to work to. Some people just go freehand and I've never been able to do that and it doesn't make you any better or worse carver if you wanna draw it. Um, you can draw it freehand, you can Use a compass, I'm actually going to use a compass just to get part of the roundness of the bowl. You can use a template if you want, a lot of people use templates. So do you use templates yourself typically? Typically not, um, I have done. Um, generally if I'm carving a lot of one style, a template would come in really handy. Um, but I tend to find them just a little bit awkward. Um, I prefer maybe doing part of the spoon Maybe I'll have like a template for just the bowl or something, but I've just found over time it just doesn't really work for me. Um, but a lot of people do, and especially people beginning, because as with everything, things get better with practice, and drawing is, is one of those things. So if you just want a shape that you can reproduce every time, a template is perfect. So would you think a template would help those watching that are maybe either carving for the first time or maybe carving your particular style of spoon that you're doing now for the first time? Do you think a template might come in handy? Definitely, it can be really frustrating when you think you've, got a, you've drawn something really nicely freehand and then you come to carve it and you realize it's completely wonky. Um, I mean, like the style that I'm doing is quite a sort of, is gonna be quite a basic eating spoon. Like, I don't know if, people watching the video would be interested if I made a template of the spoon I'm about to carve. I, I we could maybe link to it or something. I, I tell you what, if if you're down for that, I think that would be fantastic. Yeah. I yeah, think that I'd would be help happy them to. a lot. I'd be happy to. That's very kind of you. So what I'll do guys, um, so Will's gonna uh, create a spoon template for this particular style of spoon that he's demonstrating in this video. So what I will do is actually link to the template below in the description and um, also pin to the top of the comments. And what we'll do, I think what will work best is I'll link to a page on your website. Yeah. Uh, and on there, um, obviously you can have the template and then obviously people can download that sure. and use that as a reference point. That'd be awesome, that's very kind of you, Will, yeah, no thank worries. you. Cool. So what's next in the process, Will? Um, so like I said, I am not great at doing freehand carving. 
I like to work to a line and I'll start with a sort of central line. Having carved the wood in this sort of orientation, we started with the bark up like this, as you carve down you get these nice central rings as opposed to if I'd carved it sort of from as in like a, a slice of cake so so for example using the chopping block as the example oh yeah, that's a good, good way to look at it so this this spoon was like that and I'm carving down from the bark if it's a bigger piece of wood I'd probably do it into slices like this and from this slice I don't know if you can, is this picking up on the camera? The spoon would be like that. So for example, you've got so the rings, sorry. So you've got a spoon just there. Yeah. Um, so maybe hold that up next to the block. So you can see this one is like this with the bark up here. This one is carved like this. So it'd be round like that. So you can see the rings across and you get this sort of stripey grain. Interesting. So it's not really, there's not really benefits. One thing that some people say is perhaps this is slightly less strong because you're going to have some more short grain in the handle. For example, so, you know, the handle's going to come back a lot like this and there's only that much uh, sort of grain length in the handle. Whereas when you carve it like this, it doesn't kind of work the same way. The, the grain runs all the way in the length. Does that make sense? But generally, you haven't found a huge amount of difference, really. Apart you, kind from of need to put, you kind of need to put a bit of strain on the spoons for these, that sort of weakness to, to show. So just a normal eating spoon when you're eating your porridge or whatever, you're never going to have a, have a problem. So a lot of it is aesthetics. A lot of it also is just the econ uh, economy of the wood. Whatever you can get, you know, I try to get as many spoons out of one log as I can. Um, but another thing that these rings can be helpful for is to get the cent center point. So I just follow the sort of high point of the rings. You can use a ruler for this if you want. And one way to sort of check if it's uh, straight is to look at a low angle, sort of look down like this and all the wonky bits pop out quite well. So that's not too bad, even though it looks like a five-year-old drill. So again, through experience, I found, like I said, two thumbs is about a good eating spoon width for me. People with big mouths want big ones, obviously people with small mouths, blah, blah. So that's roughly about four and a half centimetres. So I like to use a compass just to put in, actually, let's go back a bit further. Because this bit can be really tricky. Hold on a sec. This can be really tricky to draw freehand and get an even curve on both sides. So literally, all I want is that part that I've just done with the compass. I'm not going to use it for anything else. The um, cowl spoon that I use, that I showed you earlier, I use a compass to draw that because it's a round bowl. And for my scoops and things, I'll use a compass. And then I'll do the rest freehand. So I've got these sort of, these wide points now. And I'll do the rest just freehand. I found it's worth spending a little bit more time on the drawing, even though in the end you're going to just be working by eye once the lines are gone. But if you've got a, quite an accurate line to work with in the first place, it saves you a lot of holding it up, looking at it, changing a bit, holding it up again, realizing you took too much off that side, going back to the other side, then you take too much off that side and you end up just getting pissed off, basically. Uh, the handle, you can have a sort of stop transition on the neck like this, or you can have a more rounded one. With this 
even though I've done a stop on on this spoon, with this shaped bowl, I prefer a, a, a sort of smoother curved transition. So again, this is where a template can be really handy, trying to get even on both sides of the handle. You can use a ruler if you want, and you can measure points up and down the handle and just join the dots. Um, or you can just try and wing it. And what tends to happen is it looks great until I really look at it. That's not too bad first time. Obviously, there's lots of different designs you can do. You can have sort of a bulge out here, you can have it straight up and a little pinches in here or whatever you like. That's one thing, nice thing about not using a template is you can make everyone different. But then you can also use a template and then adapt it afterwards. So, however you want to do it. So that's pretty good and I'm ready to get back to the axe work. Um, so the top's done and I'm actually not going to touch this top edge again until I get to the knife, which is another reason why I spent so long um, on the outline. If I was then just going to carve over it, it's not worth spending the time. So I like to only draw it once and then um, when I've pretty much got the shape that I want, then I can carve it off and I'm not going to alter anything. I'm not going to need a line to, to, to follow. So I'm going to start off now by just coming in both sides and getting the width that I want. You want to be careful axing down here that you don't come in too far and split off the bowl. There's lots of um, sort of mistakes you can make that in the end just result in a change of design, like a heavy axe hit on the tip of the bowl or something and it means you just have to round the bowl a bit more, but things like splitting off the side of the bowl are no coming back from that. So that's close enough on that side. This side, just working towards me. You can kind of lean back and see what you're doing, or I tend to just ax a bit, have a look. Pretty close there. So I'll come back this way. Let's put a couple of stop cuts. Okay, so now I've got the width that I want. I'm going to start working on the back. I could just come straight down here, but I find it much easier if I take the corners off first. And I sort of work down from here. I'm looking down this line, and I'm going to give myself, make sure I don't go too thin. So I'm, I'm keeping quite an even thickness all the way there. Doing the same on the other side. So you see I've got this on both sides and then this is much easier for me to take off, there's much less wood. And I'm pretty much coming up to meet this line. Oops. So having said that I wanted to avoid a knot in the bowl, turns out <laughs> we've got one almost right in the center of this one, but that's not a problem. That's 
pretty good. I'm also looking at this thickness here and do I want to take any more off the bottom? Because with an eating spoon, you don't want the bowl to be too deep because you want your, you kind of want your lip to be able to almost sweep the bottom of the bowl. So if you do it too deep, like a soup spoon, it's going to be less pleasant to eat with. So I probably want to take a little bit from about here. And I want to be accurate, so I'm going to just bump this off like that. And then I'm pretty much the same principle as I did on the handle. I'm coming from one corner. Like that. And then the other corner. And then the middle. I'm not worrying too much about the sort of curve of the bowl yet. I just want kind of a square blank. That looks pretty good. So just like a like a Nike tick, just do it. Um, next thing I'm going to do is I'm what I'm, I'm going to leave these parts on until the very end because when you're axing down, it's good to have a sort of square, more stable base. If I carve that off now, it's a bit more wobbly and it just makes things a bit more awkward, um, a bit less accurate. So I'll do the handle first. And I like to come down here, just take it off all the way. The reason I do this is in a minute I'm going to put some stop cuts in here and come back down the handle. And you can, it's not totally necessary to do this, but I found in the past, when I'm splitting down the handle towards a stop cut, if I come right from the top, there is a risk that the split can go into the handle. Whereas if you are coming from much lower down, it tends to behave itself a lot better. Interesting. So it's just a bit safer. Um, you'll see. You'll see when I when I come to do it. So I'll just take it. It's always good to take sort of edges off because it leaves you with less wood to remove, which is easier. And so you can be more accurate. Um, okay, so I'm going to put the stop cuts in. If you want to use a saw, you can. You can just saw straight in. You can even put two stop cuts just to give, when you're, when you're splitting down, to give yourself a kind of safety buffer. Because if you split past one, you've got the second one. Because what you really want to avoid is splitting down to the stop cut through and taking the bar off them. It just becomes firewood. Would it be possible, just for the benefit of those watching, where if you do one side the way you would normally do it and another one with a sawn stop cut? Sure. Yeah, if that's yeah. possible? Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, let me grab another saw because the, the bow saw is definitely <laughs> a bit over the top for this one. So now you've got, is it a uh, Japanese saw? Yeah, these things are amazing. Uh, this one's double sided. One with the smaller teeth is for cross cutting and this is for uh, sort of ripping down the grain um, it's kind of like a mini silky almost mm -hmm. really really clean finish nice uh, it's an essential part of most woodworkers toolkit um, yeah so cutting the stop cuts you can use an axe if you don't have a saw to hand and that just sort of involves cutting across the grain you want to sort of give it a bit of a V. So obviously you can't just keep cutting in with the axe, so you kind of come at it like this. Um, can be a bit scary when you, don't, when you haven't sort of been practicing. So a much easier and more accurate way is to use a saw. And what I'm doing is I'm aiming for what's going to be the narrowest part of the, the neck. So I'm going to cut in just about to the line. Is it easier if I come around? Yeah. 
One thing you, you want to be aware of is that you're cutting at equal distance from the top and the bottom because it's quite easy to get the saw uneven and you, you, you hit the line on this side but you realise you've gone far too far on the back. So the best way to do that is just to keep checking. One thing I find is quite a good way of checking is if I put my this finger at the end of the cut here and my thumb at the end of the cut here and then I can look down oh, and you can see my thumb is slightly further that way so it means I need to cut a little bit more on the back. So oh, can you see that? Yeah. It's just a good way of sort of gauging the distance. So that's pretty good. I'm just about at the line. I don't want to go too far over the line because I'll be left with an untidy saw mark that I'll have to carve off. So what I was saying about splitting down the handle before, the split will always want to go towards the side of the wood that's the narrowest. So if I'm splitting down here, down where the line is, it will tend towards this side where there's a really thin bit of wood because the pressure is going to come out that way rather than towards that way. So one reason I axed this is to encourage the split to want to go that way rather than that way. And I can just start to ax in a little bit here and I'm being really careful. You can see the split's already started and I'm just going to I'm listening, I'm feeling, I'm watching. So there's no need for me to hit it again because it's already split down. You can pop out like that. You can put your ax down, you can pull it off. Then I'm gonna come back and do the same thing again. So you're basically creeping up to the line. Pretty much. You can try and do it in one go, but obviously this side, this part is wider. So it's not generally gonna split all the way down. The way that you, the way that you're going to want it, and so now I'm so that's pretty good. Something like that, that distance there, is so easy for me to carve with a knife. There's no point in risking an errant axe hit to try and get even closer. Though I might just come back and take that bit off. I think that's a good thing to think about is people are always wondering like, oh, when should I stop axing and go to the knife? You want to go as far as you're comfortable, but you also need to remember that you can take off a lot more wood with the ax. Um, but like I said, like that's nothing. And if your knife's sharp, I c I'll, I'll do that in one or two sweeps of the knife. So I'm, I'm fine with that. Uh, I'm going to leave this part on for now and I'm going to use this as a bit of a shoulder and I'll show you how I would axe in this side. I'm going to come from about here and can you see I'm coming from different angles creating this sort of V like if you were coming down a tree. Then as I've got that I'm going to come back up I'm looking over at my line and I'm going to come fairly close to the line. I'm using the weight of the axe mostly for this. I don't need to be swinging hard. And I'm coming in. Now, I don't want to split back up here now because I'm going to lose some of my handle. So I'm going to come back in here to that narrow point. This time I'm kind of twisting this way towards, so I make sure I split these chunks off rather than split up, up the handle. And I'm looking I'm pretty close. Again, I don't want to get too close because I can do that with a knife. So you can see I'm close enough with these little bits and I'm going to just split down the same way that I did before. Again, just looking and feeling for the cut and the split. 
constantly sort of checking that it's not going over my line. So one thing that I tend to do is I like to leave a bit of wood here. I don't like to go right to the line because I find when I'm when I'm going to come around here with the knife, it just gives me a bit more leeway to get the knife right in there. And I haven't gone so far with the axe that I'm going to have to cut past axe marks or saw marks, creating a, a thinner neck than I want. Because obviously the neck is, is the weakest part. It's the thinnest part of the spoon. And it's generally the part that sort of gets the most pressure. So, I mean, that's, that's how I like to do it. Some people will ax right up to the line, whatever works for you. So this bit's the, tricky, the trickiest bit for me. I'm, I'm doing the same thing, but the drawing is towards me, so I can't quite see what I'm doing. So I tend to give myself a little mark back there. So now I know that's, that's where my line is. I'm just going to follow that. I might just ax a bit further down just to get away from it a bit. I'm constantly checking. My fingers are quite close to the ax, but because I'm using such tiny swings, doesn't matter too much, so not, not in danger. So that's all right. It looks a bit rough, but that's all gonna be easy with the knife. So I've left this square. Actually, what I'm gonna do first is just sort out the bottom a little bit, thin that, and then this is going to sort of taper up to the end. That's far too thick for the end of the spoon. So it's quite wonky. That bit's a lot higher. So we'll take that off. I've ruined many a spoon with careless axe strokes at this stage, so I'm always quite careful. Pretty good on that side, and I'll just even up on this side. Again, I've left these corners on because this means I can pivot it really easily like that, and I've got no movement that way, which I would have if I'd have taken these corners off already. Another thing I'll do is just take these shoulders off just to make things a bit easier with the knife. Not too much. Just something like that. And then I'm going to take these bits off. I normally just whack that corner off to give myself an easier, uh, a sort of more rollable surface as I'm going to do this bit. Again, go as close to the line as you're comfortable, but the knife will take care of those thin bits, absolutely no problem. So, not the neatest job I've ever done, but it's pretty good. It's about, let me just knock that bit off. That's about as far as I'll go with the axe. So well, this is the uh, the nighttime sitting down armchair yep. section of the video. So what's next now that we've have we completed the axe work? Yeah, I won't go back to the axe now. Um, sometimes I find that maybe I've left this a bit thick, and I'll want to go back. But generally, once I put the axe down, that's it. I won't pick it back up again. Um, so what I'm going to do now is move on to the knife. 
most spoon carvers will recognise the Mora. Is it a 106? I never know the. the yeah, numbers. I think 120 is the so This is the longer one, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I'm going to basically refine what I did with the axe, go around the outline. Um, I like to sort of lock in this shape first before I touch the top or the bottom because once that's done and I've got kind of square edges, no matter what I do depth wise, that shape's going to stay the same. Does that, does that yep. make sense? So I tend to work fairly methodically. I usually start off with the bowl. I'm just working up to the line. I'd say 50% of spoon carving is looking at what you're carving rather than actually carving. I spend a lot of time. If you took a picture of me at any random point, I'd probably look like I'm not doing anything. Just looking at a piece of wood. But it's important to try and get it even. So I know a lot of people, and me included, um, have a lot of trouble in getting both sides even, sort of sy symmetrical. Sometimes the grain can throw your eye off, and something that is symmetrical may look wonky, and sometimes the line that you've drawn can throw it off. One thing that really helps me is to hold it up to the light and squint with one eye closed. Uh, stand on one leg and <laughs> no. singing an old pirate song. Yeah. <laughs> if you hold it up and you can, it takes away all of the the other stuff that's distracting you. So you just see the outline. On top of that, sometimes other parts of the spoon being wonky can throw your eye off the part that you're looking at. So you can kind of cover one, cover the rest of the spoon, and hold that up to the light. And then you're only looking at this bit and you're like, cool, that bit looks even. Now I know I can forget about that and move on to the rest. So let me just check. Uh, yeah, that looks pretty good. Another, I mean, like I said earlier, it, the more accurate your drawing, the easier this part will be. So I'm not going to come right into the neck yet. One thing if you could just briefly touch on, I know this yep. is something I struggled with a lot when I started out, is um, the grain, cutting with the grain uh, and against the grain. Right, so you mean sort of like when to carve up the spoon, when to carve down the spoon? Yeah. Um, generally, on a sort of straight grained spoon, you can, you can go by these rules. And helpfully, it's the opposite inside the bowl to outside the bowl, or unhelpfully. So outside of the bowl, you're always carving that way and that way. This is from the widest point. So the widest point of this spoon is here. So I'm going to be carving towards the tip, towards the tip. Then from here, towards the neck and towards the neck. And then from here, I'm going to be carving down. If you kind of think of it, it's easier to think of with a, when the grain's, let me put this knife up by a second. When the grain's like this, if you think of it as sort of the, the fibers of the grain, and the spoon's like that, if I try to cut this way, I'm kind of cutting into the grain, so I'm sort of cutting and trying to push and I'm hitting the ends and you're going to dig in and you're never going to get a good finish. If your knife is really, really sharp, you can go slightly against the grain and get a good finish. But in general, you want to be going this way, sort of downhill. So you're going off the end 
of the grain like this you're not digging in it um, it's something that is quite difficult to sort of explain even with a with a diagram but it's one thing that you will just through practice and experience you'll pick it up and it'll become kind of second nature um, when you start getting pieces of woods pieces of wood like a crook which is a naturally bent piece of wood then the grain starts sort of doing its own things and it's, it's a bit less predictable but with straight grain wood you can generally just follow these rules and you should be fine but again like it's just practice and experience and it'll come it can, it can be frustrating I find if you're trying to make a cut and it seems more difficult than it should be you're probably going against the grain so just try it the other way and see if it see if it works so I'm just obviously I'm doing a few different grips here none of them are right or wrong it's whatever works for you basically if you like to use this sort of thumb push one use that if you prefer sort of this squeezy grip or whatever there's no there's no right or wrong way to do it so I'm going to come down the handle what I'm what I'm aiming for is to create a, a, a sort of um, a transition here this is where the grains going to change direction it's a really sort of tricky tricky part for a lot of people is getting a clean finish here so what I'm aiming is to get a nice smooth finish down the bowl and then I'm going to sort of ease my way in this way and just work away at it um, you you might have to come at it from one side and then the other side and back but um, what I find is I'll get the cleanest cut coming this way so do that on both sides so just then I started to cut in here and it sort of felt a little bit difficult so I was actually there may have been an, the knot that we saw earlier maybe here doing something with the grain so yeah, it's much easier coming back this way I think um, when you feel that you're going against the grain sometimes it's tempting to double down and really try and force it and that's the wrong thing to do you want to stop try it from the other way so again you can hold this up to the light that is as wonky as a six pound note So for this bit, I actually am not going to use this knife. I've I reground this one, and the tip is quite wide. And I find coming in here, you can hear that that chatter. It's not actually a clean finish. So I use another knife, an old. This is an old, same model, but an old one that I've sharpened a lot, and it's got a really fine tip. And I find that this one... For those who just have the standard 106, obviously that's suffice, isn't it, in terms of... It should be. I think, I think I've think i fiddled with that one a bit, and um, I don't think the ones that you'll buy are as thick-tipped. But if you, if you do just have one like this, for this transition here, you can just use the very tip, and you can do it in sections. You don't have to do the whole thing at once. So you can. It does work like that. And I'm actually getting a clean finish like that, but I find I can kind of do it all in one go with this one. So I can feel I'm going back against the grain here. I've come under the cut that I had coming down the handle. But 
what I'm going to do. I'm not going to worry about it quite yet. I'm just going to get this how I want it, this section here. Here. And just tidy that up. Then I'm going to come back. So this is notoriously the tricky part. And if you ask a lot of beginners, what do you need help with? They'll say this part. And to give a really annoying answer, it just takes practice. There are tips that you can, you can use, but you just have to keep doing it over and over. And you might not even notice the improvement, but if you just keep doing it, it will get much easier. I guess things to think about are not trying to take off too much wood at once so that you sort of dig right under and then you have to come back from this side and you dig right under and then you sort of, you end up with the tiniest little neck and it snaps as soon as you try to use it. So I tend to, like I said, come from this way and then I'm just going to really just ease my way towards it. I'm not trying to take it all off in one go. I think this one, this knife's just a little bit sharper. And I'm just using the tip. And I am actually going very slightly against the grain. But because it's a sharp knife, I can get away with it. And as I sort of approach, I'm twisting my wrist back up, sort of pulling out of the cut. It's just a tiny little bit there. There we go. And then maybe I want to clean that up a little bit. So, yeah, I mean, that's that's the best way to do it, is just come at it a bit at a time. Um, I think a lot of a lot of the mistake that a lot of people make is trying to have this transition too tight. So you're going to get the best finish when there's an almost sort of flat section of wood where the transition is. So if you try and have it like this, you're going to have a lot of trouble coming in and then coming back. But if it's more like sort of that, and you have a section that's flat, you can come in flat and then come in on this flat and it just, it will give you a much cleaner finish. I hope that makes sense. It does in my, in my head. I don't know <laughs> if it, it's coming across as it is in my brain. So the other side, I'll swap knives again. I do know um, that Dave Cockcroft is selling some fin what he calls finishing knives that have really fine tips and I've heard good things. I'm sure something like that, they have quite fine tips, something like that would be good for this as well. Other Daves are available. So now I'm not just thinking about getting a clean finish, but I'm thinking about trying to get it even to the other side too. That looks all right. I do always find one side easier than the other for some reason. So hopefully the other side was the tricky one. Nope. So you can see I've just lifted up that 
I'll come back from this side. There we go, that looks all right. So, that's the outline. Done. So is that the side profile done then? Yeah, or the top profile, like whichever you want to call it. Um, that shape is in there, so now whatever I do to the top and the bottom, hopefully this will stay. If I've kept these sides square, this shape will stay the same. Um, so I'm going to concentrate on this top profile now. It's quite an untidy transition, it's sort of straight edges down and up. So what I'm going to do is carve the edges of the spoon, try and make a bit more uh, curved and just a bit easier on the eye and nicer to, nicer to use. Um, I'm going to be carving from the tip back, um, just just on the edge. I don't have to do the whole the whole width of the spoon. I'm just looking at the edge here. And I'm trying to come underneath this point where we where we put the stop cut earlier. This is just a case of sort of working on one side and then trying to get the other side to match. So I'm sort of looking at it from the end, trying to see that it's a nice flow. It can be a bit awkward gripping it from the sending cutting so you can rest it in your leg or just keep your fingers out of the way. So here, this sort of feels like you should be not going this way. It feels like it would be against the grain but it seems to, it seems to work. I think because it's on an angle, it's almost like you're carving down the log rather than up the grain. That looks okay. So I just want to look at the other side now and see how much I need to do to match. This is a lot of just take a bit off, have a look, take a bit off, have a look. And I tend to sort of work in sections so that looks pretty even, so then I'll move to this bit and then I'll come back. Also looking at it from down the handle just give you another perspective sometimes you see things that you didn't see from the other way yeah a bit of a lump here so I'll just take that off so how does that look to you? I think it looks fairly even on both sides and from the back. So I'll, I'll start to do the top as well and sort of blend that in. Um, take out the axe marks, maybe sort of sh um, bevel the sides of the handle just to join up with these cuts. And then I'll have my top profile. So just Coming down the handle. I'm not worrying too much about getting a good finish here yet. So it doesn't matter if you've got a few fiddly bits. You can just pick them off and I'll come back to them later.
So I've got a bit of too much of a lamp I want to take out. That's looking alright. Again, with the log this orientation where you get the rings, you also, especially in wood with this grain, you get these cool sort of stripy patterns. You can, um, depending on the shape of the top, you can make kind of funny little troughs like this, or if I have just like a one ridge running down the entire length, it kind of looks like a feather. So if you've seen Balm the Spoons, Feather Spoons, that's how he does that. He just carves a ridge down. So we'll just now I'll just meet them up. And then I'll go one more. And that looks pretty good. So obviously this lumpy bit will be carved out when I carve the bowl. So I'm just looking at the rim here and that looks good to me. Uh, so top side's done, profile's done, and now I'll concentrate on the back. Um, I'm just gonna start off taking some of these lumps off. And then I'm going to bring this back side up to meet the top rim. I'm not going to go all the way because it will leave me a little bit of um, a little bit of room to adjust if I need to. I tend to work in sort of circles in the bowl. So I'll do an outer circle and then I'll move in. The reason I do that is because I found a lot in the past that I've worked for ages on the back of the bowl and I've got a really nice finish and then I look at it from this way and it's still too thick. So you have to go back and do it all again. And I find if I do the outer rim, get that to the thickness that I want it, then do the inner rim, it seems to take away all that faff and waste of time of um, doing the same thing over and over. So then I'll come back up this way. Again, there's a change of grain direction here. So you just gotta be mindful of that. You can even come across the grain if you want, like that, if you're having trouble with that, that part. So here, I can come from this and I can start to go down the handle and I sort of, like a, what do you call that, like an arc. And I can either leave that cut for later or just continue all the way down. Maybe this cut. Looking at this edge here, so I don't want to go too close to that. And then on this side, this side can be a bit awkward. This is where you need to to learn how to carve left-handed. So here, rather than being able to do this sort of sweep, I'm going to be trying to replicate it but with a different cut like this and I find it using the tip 
means I can come around a bit better. And then I'll carry that down. That works okay. So then I'll move in. See, I've got a kind of continuous line around and I'll move in and do the same. I think people might find this uh, uh, fairly familiar to Adam Hawker's method. He sort of works in this way. And I, I sort of picked it up from him when I did a workshop at Spoonfest with him and kind of slightly adapted it to, to work for me, but I'll have to sort of credit him with the, the inspiration for that one. So I'm looking at it from this way, getting the thickness here. It's still thick in the middle, but here's looking good. And I'll do the same thing coming back this way. I'm not going to follow that down the handle because it's already about as thin as I want it there. So I'm going to leave that just for a, uh, one just straight down the middle later. It's still pretty thick. So I'm going to take it, take it down to the thickness I want it just in the middle now. You can see that knot. It's not really getting in the way, it's okay. You might find that the, the wood's just a bit denser around knots though, so you have to put a bit more effort in. It's okay, and then I'll come back this way. So I'm not going to be too fussy about facets or anything this time. You can spend ages following the lines around and making nice sort of facets down the spoon and, uh, and circles and things, but at the moment I'm just going to look to get a nice evenness and a nice finish. Still a little bit thick here, so I'll just take a bit more and a bit more around the edge. I find this grip good for here. You can use this one, it's a bit more powerful, but I don't find it quite as accurate. But it's good for taking off bigger chunks. I think it's probably okay. So what's next in the process, Will? So my knife work is mostly done, straight knife work. Um, I'm going to carve, carve the bowl with the spoon. Um, and then after, the, after that will be the finishing cuts, which I'll go back to the straight knife. And that'll be sort of putting the last touches. Um, so I want to take out the material inside the bowl. I find, again, I like to work to a line. So it's not even that I'm kind of going to follow this line, but I just find it's a bit easier to see than this sort of, um, sometimes grain like this can deceive your eye a little bit. So this is, this is obviously the inside of the bowl, isn't it? That's right, yeah. That you're marking out. So we can talk about grain direction inside the bowl, which is the key to getting a, a really nice finish. Um, I know a lot of people have trouble getting a good smooth finish inside the bowl, so hopefully we'll cover that. So what's your preferred spoon knife then that you use? Nick Westerman's... How's it, Blade? 
I'm not sure. I'm not sure exactly which. I think it's the faucet, um, and it has replaced all my other. I used to kind of use a bit of a combination of some. I find I need no other blade. Oh wow! So you just do the yeah, one. I rough it out and I finish it with this. Um, get on the waiting list. That's it. It's worth it. So for those that may not be familiar, Nick Westman, very respected toolmaker based in Wales. Yeah. Yeah, he, um, his knives have this hollow grind on the inside, which means that these two edges are raised and it's sort of uh, a valley in between. It makes it really easy to sharpen. You don't have to touch this edge. You just sort of, uh, what I do is I just roll up a piece of wet and dry sandpaper and just work through the grits and then I strop it and um, super easy to sharpen. And then you just strop a little bit on the back. Um, yeah, so to start with, I'll be coming across the grain just to rough it out. I'm sure a lot of people will be shouting, get your thumb out of the way, but I'm sorry. You really should have your thumb out of the way. Um, I, I have got kind of a bit of scar tissue there from just hundreds of dunk, dunk, dunk. So anyone that I would be teaching, I'd say, keep your thumb down here. Um, but bad habits creep in, don't they? So I'm coming down the grain, not, not to get a nice finish at the moment, but just because I've given myself a couple of ridges and I just find it easier to take them off like that. So it can be kind of awkward. It's, it's quite easy to hold the spoon this way, but when you turn it around, it can be quite awkward and sometimes this hand gets in the way. I find if I push the handle into my leg here, I don't have to hold on to it as tight. I can even sort of just brace it with my thumb. And then this way, my fingers and my palm are well out of the way. So I've just gone over the line a bit there, but that's fine. So I'm having a bit of trouble with this knot. Just, it's a bit tough. If we're just working away a bit. Technically, I'm going against the grain here. As you can hear, the chatter. It's not leaving a nice finish, but because I'm still roughing out, it doesn't matter at all. Oh, that's tough, that part. There are lots of different grips for spoon knives. I've always just found the sort of potato peeler works best for me. Some people uh, we'll hold it at the end of the handle and almost brace it with the other hand, especially people using uh, tooker cams and um, knives with longer handles. I just find this the best way, probably because I'm, I haven't practiced the other way, so I'm not very good at it. So I just stick to this. So we're starting to get down. This is a good time to hold it, feel for thickness, put it in your mouth. Seems all right. Um, every spoon I carve has been in my mouth. <laughs> Even the ones that don't need to. No. Even the big serving spoons. And <laughs> Charge extra for that. But it's a really important uh, part of it because if you don't try it, you don't know if it, if it works. Um, so you have to test it out. So you can see I'm coming down the grain. When we talked before about grain direction on the outside, on the inside, 
it's the opposite. So instead of coming around here on the outside, you come from the tip and the and the what would you call this? The neck end inwards. So you're coming this is the low point, this circle here. So you're gonna come down, down, and you kind of come around the edges like that. So this is the low point. That's where the grain is going to change direction. So you're going to come round to here, round to there, round to there, and sort of. And that that way is how you're going to get a really smooth finish. It's the same as everywhere else in the spoon. You know, I've got a smooth finish here because I've been going down the grain, not across it. So where I've been roughing out across the grain, I can take off that that sort of not nice finish by then coming down might be a bit bumpy at first while you're sort of cutting over the cross grain cuts but once you've got a few and I can brace it into my chest and Are you just going up to that low point? Well. I'm not, I'm not even stopping on purpose, it's just I can't carve past that because it starts to go against the grain. So you can really just go until the wood tells you to stop. I'm also going to creep up closer to these lines and maybe even past, just to give myself a bit of a rim. I'm sort of um, twisting my wrist around. This one's a little bit more tricky. You can either brace it here. I tend to use this part of the blade. You can either hold it like this, although be really careful you don't slip out and go into your hand. Or you can come around here. And then I'm gonna So this is really nice and smooth now. And then I can do the same back here. From this side, just come straight down. Now if you're really good, you can, in the same way as I did here, eat, you know, sort of come from one way and the other way and just get closer and closer. You can do that in the bowl, sort of. Uh, creep up on either side but what I always do is just I get to this point and then I just do one sweep across the middle take all that out and because this knife is so sharp I've got a nice finish anyway you don't you don't sort of see the kind of uh, furriness that you might if you did it on, on the outside. So you can see now, it's really smooth from both ways and then one across the middle. And it just needs a bit of tidying up on these, these parts. I'm gonna come down and then across. I also wanna define the rim up here as well. It's a bit untidy at the moment, so I can Sweep across like that, get a clean finish. This is still going with the grain because I'm sort of coming around. Same on this side. So you still have a nice finish. Or you can just come straight down like this. So then across. And then I've gone a bit deeper here, so I'll probably just come back again. Can be a bit fiddly. 
But see, I'm not taking a lot off at all. So like I said, this knife being sharp uh, means that I can get a good finish across the grain. And that is like one of my top tips is to keep your tools as sharp as you can because it will only benefit you. There's no benefit of having a blunter knife for anything. You're always going to get a cleaner finish with a sharper knife. Pretty much done in the bowl. If you're if you're carving uh, a piece of wood that might be difficult to get a, a nice finish on, something like really fresh birch or willow or something, you can find you can't get a nice finish straight off when it's green. So you might want to leave it inside for a day or two and come back to it and when it's dry you'll be able to get a much cleaner finish. This cherry is pretty much ideal where it's wet enough that it's easy to carve but I'm getting a really nice smooth finish so I'm not going to bother putting this inside I'll just I'm sort of in the spoon zone and um, I'll just carry on. So for most people what you're saying is um, at this stage they would just technically leave it for about a day or so yeah, come back and then do the side and then just do the finishing cuts yeah you don't have to um and some woods are absolutely fine to just go straight off um another thing you might find is as it dries it could warp or twist and so sometimes you might want to leave it a bit thicker put leave it to dry and come back and you might find the handle sort of gone off or something and so if you've left yourself enough wood to play with, you can correct that when it's dry. And then you know by finishing when it's dry, it's not going to move again. Um, but I don't mind too much about that. So I'm just sort of looking at I've probably a little bit more to take off in the bowl, actually. And you can see I've still got quite sort of thick edges and sharp edges and stuff and if I hold it it's not that comfortable, I don't like the feel of that in my hand and if I put that in my mouth that's not going to feel nice on my lips. So even though that's a perfectly functional spoon, you want to give it just some extra touches just to make it a bit nicer to use, a bit nicer to feel and it also adds a lot aesthetically as well. So I'll put this knife down for now and I'll come back to the straight knife and I'll start by bringing this edge right up, the bottom edge right up to the top. The thinner this edge, the better it will be for sort of scooping stuff up, picking things up in a bowl. I'm kind of working in the same way as when I was uh, carving this part before, in both directions. So there, that's a much thinner now. And then I come back here. Not too much I need to do there. Just take the shoulder off. And then I'm sort of looking at it, I might take this ridge off just to even it all out a bit and blend it in. So that looks pretty good. Then I'll continue from this rim. In fact, just looking at this, I can see I'm a bit thick on the end of the handle. So I'll take a couple of layers off there. Not much. That's a bit better. And then holding it, 
that feels a bit nicer. I feel a little bit like I could have a bit more room for my finger underneath. So I'm just going to take that off. Feel that again. That's a bit nicer. There's sort of not much um, method to this. I'm just kind of eyeing up the spoon and seeing if there's any little bits that need adjusting before I chamfer all the edges, which will sort of soften them. So I'm going to chamfer this edge. I'm going to come around here. I like putting this little feature just to sort of this nice little line all around that will then come up to the end of the handle. And the same on this side. And then I'm going to do the same on the top. Really thin chamfer around here. Just be careful going against the grain because obviously we carve down this way, but you want to carve up around the edge. So you have to kind of find that um, spot where you're not carving up the grain here, you're coming around the grain here, if that makes sense. And then I'll come up here. I think, what do you think about this? Should I leave it sort of three edges or should I, should I soften these ones off? Um, I quite like it. Yeah? Three edges, yeah. Maybe let's leave it like that. I'll tidy this one up a little bit. just spotted a little rough bit in the bowl but I'll come back to that in a sec. So this bit can be a bit tricky. Again it's the next transition. So I'll come down, I'm going to chamfer down the edge here and then come back up and meet it. This is a very satisfying cut. So I'm going to go and I'm really sort of feeling for where the grain changes direction, which is about there. And then a really just light, there we go. Same on the other side. That's it. He's a good little uh, decoration staying on the Christmas tree. So I went a little bit far underneath, so I'll just, there we go. Okay, I'm going to just, uh, I'm just going to tidy up the inside rim of the bowl. Again, to sort of bring it closer to the edge. I don't want to go too thin, just because it'll weaken it. The last thing to do is just put a little whatever you want on the end. I tend to keep it pretty simple. I'm just going to take off that pencil mark and then I just come from one side, 
try and do the same on the other side. Then try and do the same on this side. <laughs> Almost there. I just, I like a little, just a top like that. I, I prefer it to a sort of flat or, And then I'll just, tiny little chamfers here. And take the corners off. Test it. It's a good one. Yeah, done. So there you have it, my friends. That is a wrap for this video. Will, thank you so much. No problem, mate. Really this is the you. first time for Will on video, man. I think you've done absolutely amazingly well. Seriously, it was really, really well. It's always nerve wracking, you know. You got me looking like the way I do, with this massive lump of a camera in front of itself. I mean, like, nice. Yeah, that was it. Is that as well? Uh, it's luckily I'm behind the camera for most of it, uh, so it's, it's a very difficult thing. But Will done really, really well. Uh, as I've mentioned before, Will is a full time green woodworker, spoon carver, uh, and what you've just seen here, he actually teaches this for a living. So I'm extremely honoured that he's allowed me to come down and document this process in order for you watching to learn at home. So there's a few things I just want to uh, finish off on. Number one, as uh, Will kindly mentioned uh, earlier on in this video, he will put together a template for this spoon that he demonstrated in this video. So what I'm gonna do to make things a little bit easy is below in the description and in pinned to the top of the comments is I'm gonna put a link to a blog post that Will has done where he links to the kind of template and obviously that's where you can actually download the template from and hopefully that will aid you at home you know carving something similar to what will demonstrated on this video also while you're there um, it will mean the world to me if you actually check out will's blog will does this for a living he teaches uh, full time so if you're based in bristol or in the west of england or you're able to travel down or even if you want him to come down as a guest instructor do get in touch using the details on that website that I'll link to down below. And on that website, you'll be able to find out a lot more about uh, uh, the way it will teach us and how you can find out about coming onto one of his courses. Also on there as well, you'll have the opportunity to look through his shop and the spoons and the myriad of things that he makes and sells. A lot of it doesn't stick around, but it's beautiful what he makes. And so it's quite popular in terms of his work that he produces. Um, and if you want the opportunity to support a green woodworker or a spoon carver, then obviously it would mean the world to me while you're on that website to also check out the stuff he has for sale there also. Another thing to mention is the, the sauce that you're making that you demonstrated earlier on in this video that you've got just here. This beast of a saw here. Look at that, man. That's a man saw, that. Uh, so you actually make these, don't you? Um, yeah, I, um, I first saw them, Ray Miz used one. Yes, that's right. And I think he used to have it on his shop. And I always thought it was quite cool. And I made one uh, out of pieces of round hazel that I used for ages and it worked really well. But I wanted to make a sort of more easily reproducible one that people could buy because just sort of looking online, there's not that many for sale. So, I, you know, I use it every day. As you can see, I even use it for little Cuts, yeah, that was right. really impressive. In all, in all seriousness, it's the first I've seen that being used for such a fine cut. Yeah, so, so um, yeah, hopefully I'll, I haven't got many at the moment, but hopefully I'll make a, a few more up and they'll be available to buy. No, they're definitely worth checking out. Once again, the details will be on Will's website. I mean, I, I just should say, even if they're not available at the time, doesn't, you know, sh just get in touch and you can commission things and I can give you, give an idea of when they will be in stock. Yeah. And, that applies in general, actually, yeah. to all the yeah. world's work. You know, if there's anything on there you see that's already sold or something that you want maybe a, a slight customization on or variation, either which way, just get in touch with Will. He has a contact page on his website yeah. um, and you can just get in touch. He's very friendly, doesn't buy Instagram. That's it, he, he, even though it looks like it. That's <laughs> it, the biting type. Um, but yeah, the website, um, yeah, if you go and check that out, and like I said, all the details are on his website. And also I'm gonna put a link to his Instagram where he's quite active. And you can get obviously a more kind of up-to-date version of what Will's going on. 
as I mentioned numerous times, he does this full time. So you can see kind of things he's making, the process, when he's out and about and events and shows and markets, etc. And it's a great way of keeping in touch with him in real time. So as a final recap, I put a link below to a blog post where you can download the spoon template. Also, if you want to buy the spoons, also look into the further work that Will does as well as the teaching side of things. All that information is on his website. And also I put a link to his Instagram. Mean the world to me. You also go check that out. And if you're on there, give him a follow. Mean the world to him. So, is there anything you'd like to add on before we depart? I think that was quite comprehensive. Is that very comprehensive? Yeah. I will say as well, just to back to the saw, it's not just for woodwork. I use it to go out and sort of forage my wood. So it was, it was kind of made in more of like a bushcraft right. sense. Um, but I mean, yeah. It's so useful. I don't know why more people aren't making them, and I sort of, um, yeah. Yeah. No, it is. It's usually I don't want to overplug it, but, it's, uh, <laughs> yeah. but I didn't say that before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. He's done generally a really, really nice job with that. They're, they're fantastically Thanks. useful, uh, yeah. especially when compacted down yeah, and stuff. Yeah, away, though. Yeah, just slide into your backpack, and that's it, man. You look like Ray Mears. Just need a bit more belly. That's it. And uh, you look like Ray Mears. So... There you have it, my friends. Once again, a sincere thank you to Will yeah, for no, the time for coming and down. my hosp hospitality, Dan. It's great to visit Bristol for the day. Um, really do hope you enjoyed those, this video and learned from it. And please do go check out the links down below. And I shall hopefully see you on the next installment of Z Outdoors. So until the next time, I hope whatever you're doing, you have a blessed day, a blessed week ahead. From Will and myself, Z Outdoors, peace out.